Hi, my name is Ricardo. And my name is Carlo. The title of our talk is Integrating SQL in the Wolfram Language. So for the next part, you want to get started, Ricardo? I can get started, but uh, we need to mention that we, are, um, we have been developing this framework um, with another person. And uh, <laughs> this is the missing guy, but I just didn't get the visa, so I will, would have loved to be in here explaining. Um, you might have heard of him on Stack Exchange. <clears throat> okay, so let's start to try to understand how all of this connects to SQL databases. During the, the second part of this talk, we will go through uh, a very simple workflow. It's important to mention that right now the functionality is limited to reading only a database. So we will, uh, we will tell you how to do that. There are several functions to do that. One is the declaration of the connection, which is called database connection. Then there is another operation that is called database inspection that allows you to see what's into the database. And then we will see how we are mapping uh, the database to the entities. We'll see some sample queries and how to deal with relations. And then uh, we'll try to see why we think that this is really powerful because it allows you to do metaprogramming uh, and to generate SQL very easily in a way that it's really, really hard to, um, you know, it will be really hard to write such query by hand. And then we also speak about future directions. So, just to start, there is a very simple function that is called database connection. It is a purely symbolic wrapper. It's not doing anything once you evaluate it. And uh, it will just take, uh, take several kind of input. One input is a file, and if it is a file, we assume it's gonna be SQL-like. Um, another form of writing it, which is something that a lot of developers are familiar with, is URL specification. So you just say something like MySQL, and then you connect uh, uh, over a database. Right now, the database are running on my machine. And then there is a full specification, which is an association that allows you to specify all kinds of stuff, plus, um, database specific functionalities that you want to, uh, to start the connection with. There are methods to connect and disconnect manually, but you usually don't need to do that. You don't need to connect. The connection is done lazily, the latest moment, and uh, you only need to disconnect. So let's see how this is work. You start by doing database inspect of Postgres. This will return to you an object that is inspectable. There is a giant association of data inside, which is the full schema of the database, which means that you can start inspecting all the tables, and you will see that there is a backend type that we inferred that that column was an integer. There is a default value. There is no index. The name is ID. It tells you if it is nullable, if there is a constraint, like, it's not, like if it is unique, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Okay, exactly. This operation is backend independent, and so it can be performed over several kind of backends. The backends we are currently planning to support are SQLite, uh, MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL, and Oracle DB. Um, and so this, this will always return uh, the, the same uh, um, uh, the same type. It will always address as a string, even if internally is is a bar char and so on. And there is a plan, of course, to specify like the low level kind of type. If you go on, you can see that this object is uh, inspectable programmatically. And uh, for example, you can extract, you can ask to this object, what are the tables that are into my database? So you can say, and this database just so that you understand what is going on with the queries we are going to do. It's, it's a very simple database that we created for testing. Um, there are person, there, 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 and there are transaction. Transaction from and to people with an amount, a date, and we will try to perform some. And you can see that if you see the foreign keys, this transaction, you see that there are foreign keys to the table person. The column that is doing it is called to, the other one is from, and it's going to the ID column of the person. And as well, there is a, there is a nation for a key that is where the transaction is happening. Nothing, nothing really um, difficult. 
And when you do anti-restore on it, <coughs> this will create the translation between the, the actual schema and, um, and the entity. So those are now entity properties that are automatically generated. The way we are doing it, the convention is this one. If you can scroll down, Carlo, to the... <coughs> so, each table generates an entity type with the same name. So if you got a table that was called person, you get out an entity class that is called person. Each column is an entity property. And so, uh, for example, in this case, there is amount. Amount will be an entity property that you can extract out of the type transaction. And foreign key will, generate, will automatically generate um, uh, a property that will return an entity of the type of basically the, the one you are referring to. So for example, in the in a person get a nation property, and we will gen, when, you, when you will be accessing the property nation, will get out an entity nation. And on the other end, it will generate uh, a reverse relation. This will be explained also later. Uh, this object is still expectable, and you can see that uh, those uh, are all uh, the relations that are created, because there were several foreign keys. This is the primary key. And those are the incoming relations from the table. Um, we also added like a couple of um, uh, features for this constructor that we think are really useful. So for example, let's say that you have a database that is in another language, I don't know, it's in Italian, and um, inside there is like clienti and you don't know what that is. Uh, you do the mapping once and you say that clienti is customers. And uh, so you can rename uh, the table name and the column names in a, in a way that they're actually making sense for you. Most of the time when you inspect the database, the database administration is coming up with really creative names. And so maybe you don't want to work with that. And we provide you a tool to you know, do some renaming. Um, and there is also, I think someone was asking for this, if it was possible to, to store uh, um, a computed property inside the entity store so that you don't need to rewrite the code over and over again. This is possible to, you can actually do that by, for example, this is age squared, and you register an entity function. Of course, this property is read only, and it's, you can think about it like a database view. So you, 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 you can actually create um, a view that is completely, um, uh, completely generated by, by other annotation or, uh, or compiled SQL expressions. This is instead a computed type. For example, in this database there, is a, there are person and there is a column name that is called sex that can be male or female. And this class now uh, generates, um, you are registering two new entity types. One is male, one is female, and they are generated by performing a filter. So each time you are referring to this uh, uh, entity type, the filter will always be there. So you don't need to repeat it. Okay, so this is just uh, very simple queries that you can do um, that connects to the one we already showed before. Just to show you that the API is literally the same and um, so you need to register the entity store. You perform this operation once. You do entity register of entity store of db that was the, the variable we got before. You can ask now what are the properties of transaction type and you get out all those properties. Now you can see that there was id from and to and uh, so you do entity value, sorry, person and age, okay. Mm -hmm. And this is now performing the, the query directly on my database locally. You can also do, for example, you have entity transaction one, you ask for the date, and you can get out directly the actual type that is a date object that you can use in Mathematica. So when the database supports it, for example, um, most databases are supporting it but SQLite. Um, so if there is support for this, you get out the native type automatically. 
Okay, so Ricardo has kind of introduced uh, uh, the concept of relation. So relation in Wolfram language kind of uh, parlance would be uh, an entity valued property. So if we evaluate person nation ID, nation ID is the native column, and that is going to, can you evaluate that? Um, that is going to be just a string, which is the two letter ISO code of the nation. On the other hand, if we, the nation, which is uh, synthesized, will have a bunch of entities that, uh, that are then queerable in, in, in themselves. So each time we find a foreign key, we construct an entity value, uh, entity valued relation, but we also construct the reverse relation. So for example, in this case, I'm taking the nation and I want to know all the persons in that nation. So if you expand that, you can see that this is an entity class that is just lazily saying, uh, I want all the persons for which the nation ID is IT, which might be empty. We don't know a priori. Uh, we can perform entity list on it to see what's inside. Uh, or, but the, the great advantage is that since this stays completely symbolic, then when you, when you ask, ask for the entity value of it, then only then the query is performed. Um, so we strongly encourage you to use entity list as little as possible, uh, at least for SQL. Um, now, what this means, as I was showing before, is when you are following these relations, you can basically do subqueries and uh, these subqueries can be also a lot more complicated than usual. So in this case, for example, when I start from person, uh, now I'm going to all the transactions uh, that where this person is on the receiving end, and then I am going to the persons that are involved in that transaction, and I compute their age, and then I aggregate it by mean, and then I divide by age. If some of you have ever used uh, SQL directly, you will know that this is quite complicated to write because yeah, when we hide this in a single entity function, these are actually multiple nested subqueries. One of them performs an inline aggregation in a sense. So with this very complex syntax, you can, and I will show you later the, the generated SQL. This is actually very complicated. Uh, moving on. So this is an example that I have kind of overcomplicated because there's an easier way to do this, but I wanted to show you something cool. Uh, okay, so let's say that I want to divide my, my transactions into uh, semesters. Uh, so what I do here is I construct with table, I construct uh, date objects uh, six months to six months, then I use between on them, partition, uh, and I basically construct a giant entity function uh, which, with a which statement inside. And so basically you would get, uh, if it's between the 1st of January and, uh, and uh, the 1st of July, you get uh, you get the one. first semester, then there's the second semester, up to six. Uh, and now that I have constructed this entity function symbolically in, in, in the Wolfram language, I, per, I extend my entity class with it so that we always have this uh, new semester property. And you can convince yourself that this is correct by looking at wh what semester they end up in. Then once I have the extended entity class, I can aggregate the entity class and you will see that now I get the count of how many transactions have happened in each semester, but they are not sorted. So I take another step and I sort it. And, uh, and now we get one, two, three, up to six. And at this point, we can do a bar chart or whatever, following, follow our, um, our usual workflow in Mathematica. Now, what is, I think, what I like about this example is that we are constructing the query step by step. And each step in itself is meaningful, and we can use it, oh, am I getting something that makes sense, or have I made a mistake? So each of those are fully symbolic things that I can construct with the replace, uh, with the table, with all sorts of constructs that you know, they're purely inert, they don't do anything, and they compose like Lego bricks. So in the end, you will perform this last query, sort count, the other ones were just for debugging, and this gets done in one single call to the database, atomic, you know that the data cannot change in the middle of that query, and everything is good and beautiful. Going forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, you want to do it? Okay. Uh, just one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not going to be the way you have to do it when we release it. It's just that we are not fully ready yet. 
it's probably going to be a third argument to entity value to get the SQL string out. Yeah, so as I was saying, we, we, we put like major effort in, uh, in trying to have like a consistent behavior across all backends. Uh, this means that we, that involves like a lot of testing and, um, and, uh, and, and so that basically we, 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 are, we are compiling all those different, every database got a different semantic. For example, if you need to do a regex match, it's gonna be different the way you express it in Postgres versus Microsoft SQL and, and whatever else. And uh, this is the actual query that is generated from a single, very simple select statement, as you can see. If you go down, when we're doing something that is, uh, that is doing an, uh, um, a numerical operation, we are casting into the database to the right data type. Because when you are doing, like, for example, a division in a database uh, between integers, the database will return to you integers. This is not the behavior we think we want, uh, especially for mathematical user, and we want to have a consistent behavior across all backends. And so we, are, we have a type inference system, and, we're, and uh, we, are, uh, we are compiling the function with a type aware uh, compiler uh, that is adding uh, casting at the right place into the database function so that then the actual result is what you expect. Yeah. Uh, I want to add, if you do want to do integer division, the right function in the Wolfram language would be quotient, not divide, and that is supported. But the default people are used to is that the divide into integer gets you a rational. Rational is not representable in SQL, so you get a real. So just to show, we were using Postgres here. Um, and so if you are, so here we are doing, so full name contains John in sensitive matching. And this is how it compiles down to Postgres. Now if you replace Carlo, the entity store with um, MySQL is not working. You need to do SQLite. Entity, that message is, is normal because the entity were already registered, we know that. And now when, when you execute it again, you will see that the, the actual query code is, is, is a little bit different. Actually, what happens with SQLite is that some functions are not implemented, like for example, there is no power. And we needed to implement using C extensions. Um, and, and, and basically use C extensions to implement several functions. And then this is all done basically by, by our framework directly. Um, the, the, this is very interesting. This is the one that Carlo was speaking about that translates to several subqueries, and that's, that's the actual code. So, yeah. Yeah, we go right from to reason this with that. <laughs> to that. I, we think that, I mean, some experts might be good enough to write SQL like that, but you probably don't want to read it. Um, so, um, okay, so we, we have been doing an overview of all the functionality. As I was saying at the beginning of the talk, um, we are only allowed reading. Writing is more complicated. It's, it's just that we are already um, developed a lot of writing functionalities. We are able to create database programmatically, but it's a matter of design right now. And so the first thing we're gonna do, of course, is to support insert statement, and then uh, we're going to move to update statement, where basically you can also write like entity functions and refer to other columns and so update, write a complex query that, that updates to several conditions. We want to support transactions, uh, so that basically you, you execute uh, one query, and then you do some other operation, and then you use it to update, and so this is called basically select for update. And so you make sure that you are creating a lock uh, so that you are not creating consistent data. Um, we want to support custom data types, uh, which means that you can have like arbitrary functions that are serializing and deserializing from the database. A, a very common example of that is, for example, MySQL doesn't natively support dates, but SQLite. you might, 
uh, yeah, SQLite doesn't natively support uh, dates, but you might get a database from someone who has given you a piece of metadata that is telling you this uh, looks like integers, but it's really Unix timestamps. And so you want to automatically register that in the entity store to return dates every time you query it. Um, so this is also something that we are starting to support internally, but we require a significant amount of design to expose to the level of polish you're used. Um, then there are native data types, Postgres, Array, HStore, JSON, and uh, a lot of other things. Database schema creation is also something very interesting that we want to do. Like if you expand this guy, the database we have been using now was written by us using this specification. So you can see that you can just define what the schema looks like. And this declaration is backend independent. So the cool thing about this is that you can start by defining a schema and work with SQLite on your machine and start performing all your application logic and test that everything is working. And then when you're ready, you can just switch to another database like Postgres, MySQL on production. It will work exactly the same. And, and you don't have to worry about all the details like whether they use numeric or decimal, varchar or text, uh, and so on and so forth. We'll normalize the type names for you. Or another. No, no, no. This is already, this no, is already working. Uh, we don't yet expose. Uh, we don't yet expose this functionality, but. But it's we already be working that. because we need it for testing. Yes. So. And uh, for example, another thing that you can do is that you inspect a database uh, that is, I don't know, Postgres. Then you do a data dump, and then you re-import it into another, uh, and you get a copy on another backend. And we also want to support database schema migration. So adding a column, they need the tables, and things like that. And that was us. Awesome. <laughs>